Welcome to lecture 41. In this lecture, I want to talk about the TOV equations. Recall that we have studied the Schwarzschild solution for a spherically symmetric static empty space time in lecture 22. If we now want to think about stars in general relativity, stars do consist of matter, so the Schwarzschild solution does not describe the structure of stars. In this lecture, we want to rederive the structure equations for static matter in general relativity. The starting point is again the Ashton equations with the cosmological constant set to zero because we're only considering uh, small regions of space time. We will again look for static and spherically symmetric solutions. For spherically symmetric problems, it's again useful to employ spherical coordinates, radius r, angle theta, and angle phi. In terms of the spherical coordinate, we want to make the metric ansatz, such as the line element being equal to minus a of r dt squared plus b of r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, where a of r and b of r are two arbitrary functions of the radius r. Note that this is the same metric ansatz that we did for the Schwarzschild solution. Unlike for the Schwarzschild solution, we also need to choose a form of the energy momentum tensor now. Since we're interested in static situations, it's reasonable to approximate T minu by the perfect fluid form, which is this equation 41.3. Note that this is a reasonable approximation, but not an exact statement because there can be additional contributions to the energy momentum tensor that are static, um, but higher order in derivatives. Um, but we will ignore those since for most practical purposes, they will only offer small deviations. Using the perfect fluid form for the energy momentum tensor, we now restrict to static fluids, so fluids that have vanishing space-like velocities. So the fluid four vector must be given as a zero component and a zero in the space-like components. And we can fix the uh, component u0 by requiring that the four velocity has to be normalized to minus one. If we um, write this in terms of the zero zero component of the metric and the um, u zero component of the fluid velocity, we find that has to be, this has to be equal to minus a times u zero squared. Solving for u0, we find that u0 has to be the inverse square root of the factor a, which appears in the metric. And if we then plug this into the form of the energy momentum tensor, now with lower components, we find that the energy momentum tensor is a diagonal matrix with the entries a times energy density epsilon, b times pressure, r squared times pressure, r squared times pressure times sine squared. Now that we have all the components of the ancient equations, um, we find that there are three independent equations described by the ancient equations. The independent components can, for instance, be chosen as the TT component of the ancient equations, the RR component of the ancient equations, or the theta theta component of the ancient equations. We can look at those equations as they are, but it is customary and simplifies matter quite a bit if we do a change of variables. In particular, instead of using the metric function a of r, we want to use e to the 2 alpha of r, where both of those are a and alpha are arbitrary functions. And we want to express v of r as 1 over 1 minus 2 gm of r over r, where again m is an arbitrary function. In particular, uh, there is a similarity between this function v of r and the solution that we got for our Schwarzschild solution, um, where m for Schwarzschild was a constant. Here now it's an arbitrary function of r that we still have to find. Um, so in terms of these uh, new variables alpha and m, the tt and rr component of the Einstein equations then can be written in the following form. The uh, derivative of the function r, of the function m with respect to r, is given as four pi r squared times epsilon, and the derivative of the function alpha is given as gm plus four pi r cubed gp over r times r minus two g. 
Um, from this results, it should already become important. It should already become clear why it was that we chose in particular this uh, change of variables for B, because if you look at this equation here, we find that the change in mass with respect to radius is given as four pi r squared times the energy density, where four pi r squared is the uh, spherical, is the, is the surface of the sphere, um, a spherical shell, and energy density is the mass density. So if we integrate this thing here, we get something of units of the mass. So basically, um, the n of r here really is the mass function that we have, or that we will have when we talk about stars in general relativity. The second equation here is harder to interpret. Um, and in fact, we will still uh, rewrite this equation before getting to our final form. So we have two of the independent components in these two equations that I just discussed. There's a third component uh, from the ancient equations, which we could use to close the system. However, it's much more economical to employ a different equation, namely the meta equation coming from energy momentum conservation or d mu t mu is equal to zero. For a static system, um, it turns out that only uh, the spatial components of this equation here contribute, so we can set mu is equal to r. And if we, in particular, pull the index mu downstairs, which we can always do by contracting with the metric factor, this equation here um, has a particularly simple form, and it becomes epsilon plus p alpha prime is minus epsilon prime. So again, the prime stands for derivative with respect to the radius. Now, this is a third equation for our variables. We can use it, for instance, to eliminate alpha prime in the equations, which we'll do. So if we do uh, eliminate alpha, then we find a set of two coupled differential equations, uh, one for m and one for epsilon, that um, is describing the structure of stars that contain matter in general relativity. These equations are known as the Tolman, Oppenheimer, and Volkov equations, usually abbreviated by the acronyms TOV. And they sort of um, constitute two equations for the three unknowns, epsilon, P, and M. So there are two equations here. We have three unknowns. So in order to close the system and actually get results for star structure, we need to supplement them by an additional equation, such as the equation of state P is P of epsilon for matter. The TOB equations describe the structure of matter in GR, assuming hydrostatic equilibrium. And the structure of the stars will depend on um, the uh, particular matter that we want to describe. Uh, in particular, they will be different if uh, we want to describe ordinary stars, not the typo here, ordinary stars, uh, white dwarfs, or neutron stars. Because the equations are the same, it's just the equation of state that is different between these two different objects. Um, if we go ahead and solve the TOV equations, it will tell us also when a star's mass becomes too great for its pressure to be supporting its own gravity, such that uh, if the star becomes too massive, the star will no longer be stable and it will collapse into a black hole. So this will be subject of the uh, subsequent lectures where we discuss in particular the TOV solutions for neutron stars. And that concludes the present lecture.